Hello there, and welcome to our final video on microfossils, in which we're going to be meeting the organic walled microfossils. These are shown on the right hand side here, and these are microfossils which make their hard bits out of organic compounds, often very, very large molecules that comprise primarily carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And these are actually, so perhaps surprisingly, some of the most chemically inert um, biological polymers that are, are out there in the living world. In particular, over the course of this video, we're going to have re relatively brief introductions to spores and pollen. So uh, I apologize already right now in case I say pores and spollen, which is really easy to do when talking about this group repeatedly. And we're going to meet uh, very briefly a weird group called the dinoflagellates. I am going to miss out, even though they're important, um, a few microfossil groups. I'm going to miss out the acritarchs, which are small organic walled microfossils, um, which are of an unknown biological affinities. So basically they're, they're members of this group, don't have a clue what they are. Um, I'm also going to miss out the tasmanetids, which are small um, hollow spheres with a thick um, kind of wall made of a, a very inert um, compound called sporopollenin. Um, at least living representatives of what look like these are um, the cysts of a form of, of algae, so th those things could be algae. And I'm going to miss out the chitin chitinozoa, I should say, sorry, uh, kind of a, this is a group of flask-shaped and organic-walled marine microfossils that, again, we don't actually know what they, what they are. I suppose hence me missing them out to an extent, because I can't easily tie them to living groups. So more generally, um, the study of organic walled microfossils, including spores and pollen, as shown on this slide here, is a form of a thing called palynology. Palynology is an informal classification derived from the Greek word for sp to sprinkle. And basically what palynology is, is the study of nine groups of, um, of fairly important organisms that are all highly resistant to acids. These are all micro, also organic microfossils that are the last things left when you use really, really strong acid um, to dissolve a wide range of rocks. Um, in terms of preparing them, therefore, I wanted to make this into a separate slide because they are amongst the most labor intensive of all of the microfossils that we've discussed. And they also involve incredibly dangerous chemicals. Um, so if you're ever in a position um, where you're actually having to work on these, I I, you should um, be trained by someone with extensive experience in these techniques. And I would encourage you to think about the health and safety aspects of this work. So what you can do to prepare any paleontological uh, so that's, that's any fossils in palynology, is break down clays, silts, mudstones, sandstones, limestones, and shales into small fragments ready for, um, ready for processing. You then react them with hydrochloric acid in a fume cupboard, removing carbonates. You then put them in a plastic tub um, and add hydrofluoric acid to remove silicates. You put this in a plastic tub because um, hydrofluoric acid dissolves glass, so it's one of the strongest acids. Uh, you really don't want to um, drop it on yourself because it, it's, it's really bad for your bones and obviously all of the things it, um, it uh, burns through on the way to your bones as well. So be very, very careful if you're ever dealing with hydrofluoric acid. There are lots of safety precautions involved. Further steps after that are often required, but those um, tend to depend on the exact sample that you're looking at. Generally, you can say, uh, identify that palynological slides are examined using either transmitted light microscopes, um, generally very high objective ones, so lots and lots of magnifications, or they are studied using a scanning electron microscope. So let's meet uh, this group in a bit more detail. So spores and pollen are the remnants of part of the life cycle of terrestrial plants and they're extremely resistant to wind, water, acid, lots of other things. So we're up here on our tree of life amongst the plants. You can see some interesting examples in a scanning electron micrograph of what these things actually look like on the right hand side here. So both spores and pollen are produced during the life cycle of a plant and they're associated with the reproduction of that organism. Generally, 
uh, spores are less than 200 microns in diameter, but we have from certain geological time periods, things called megaspores, which can um, reach up to millimeters in size. These may be associated with, for example, giant horsetails and club mosses. Pollen is generally pretty small, between two and 150 microns in diameter. The earliest possible spores appear in the order Vision, things called cryptospores. We don't really know what they're related to. And definite um, spores associated with what we recognize today as plants um, appear in the Silurian. And ever since that point, there are loads of both spores and pollen. Well, loads of spores in the fossil record. Pollen actually evolved quite a bit later, sometime in the Jurassic through to the Cretaceous. Both of these um, microfossils are incredibly widespread. This is because they can be carried by wind or water across both non-marine and marine environments. So they're basically, they're, they're, they tend to be fairly global. Um, they're extremely important, especially in understanding the uh, late Paleozoic in terms of biostratigraphy. Um, they're used regularly in, for example, the coal measures, the rocks around the Manchester region, which come from the Carboniferous period. As you might expect, given that, they're used in geological exploration by both oil and coal companies, um, looking for evidence of dates of rocks, but more generally, they're used in biostratigraphy for research, in paleoclimatology, and they're useful for understanding the thermal maturation history of a rock, how um, much it's been heated up, and for envir paleoenvironmental analysis, so understanding environments of the past. And I wanted to finish today by introducing you to a group of organisms called the dinoflagellates. So these represent a clade of single-celled eukaryotes. So these are members of the phylum dinoflagellata. Once more, we're around this area of the tree that we've called the protists. Single-celled organisms related to um, plants, animals, fungi, that kind of thing. Um, dinoflagellates form plankton in both marine and fresh waters. And it's an interesting divide. About half of dinoflagellate species are autotrophs, which possess chloroplasts, so they make their own energy, as it were, and the remaining half do not photosynthesize, so they're heterotrophs. They eat other organisms and other organic material for energy. Members of this group possess two flagella. One of those is used to power the movement of the organism, whilst the other one is more passive. It acts a bit like a rudder. And these are known from fossils through um, from the earliest uh, members of the group in the Triassic um, through to today, but they may have a far deeper history. So they're useful for biostratigraphy and you may come across them in some settings. But that's it from me for this particular set of microfossils and that actually that's it for microfossils as a whole. If you want to learn more I can strongly uh, recommend this textbook by Howard Armstrong and Martin Brazier Microfossils which is available in, in our library. It's the go-to reference for microfossils and if you're ever having to do this in earnest for any form of research or for any job it would be an incredibly useful resource. With that I'll leave it there. I hope you've enjoyed living living learning about microfossils and I will see you at our next in-person session. Have a good one.